to arrive and then we'll start. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today for this very important discussion. My name is Eve Geddy and I'm the director of Amnesty's European Institutions Office based in Brussels, leading Amnesty's work to the EU and Council of Europe. And it's a real honor to moderate this roundtable discussion today on transnational repression. And I'm very happy that Amnesty is joining Human Rights Watch, Freedom House, Citizen Lab, and of course our host, Hannah Neumann, MEP, for this timely and critical discussion. And let me begin firstly by thanking our host, MEP Hannah Neumann. We have one hour and 15 minutes to explore some of the key trends on transnational repression in the EU and globally. And we will highlight the impact on human rights defenders as well as critics who have left their countries. And we will be asking the critical question, what can the EU and particularly the next European Parliament do about this issue? I'll just speak one minute for some practical issues. The event as advertised will be live streamed on YouTube. We have interpretation available in English and French. So a reminder to everybody to speak slowly and clearly for the benefit of our interpreters. And um, there is a questions and answers box also where you can ask questions to the panelists. This is a moderated questions uh, and answers um, forum, so they will be made visible to the panel once, in, once approved. For those of you who wish to intervene and ask your question directly, please do raise your hand. So we have five speakers today. Uh, each speaker will have five minutes. So a reminder to, to colleagues on the panel to keep your interventions brief. And without further ado, I will pass uh, to Hannah Neumann, MEP, for opening remarks. And I think we really look forward to hearing from Hannah what she's been doing in the European Parliament on the issue of transnational repression, giving her some reflections of how she sees the issue, and also hopefully can point us in some directions about what the European Parliament can do. Hannah, may I pass to you? Thank you so much, Eve. And um, before I will go into detail and hopefully answer some of your questions, um, allow me to start by thanking Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, um, Freedom House and Citizens Lab for continuously raising awareness on the issue of transnational oppression, but also for providing us with a good research input. And I also know a number of victims um, with factual, um, actual um, support when they are under threat, either online or offline. So your work is tremendously um, important. And I think we need um, to live up to expectations on our side um, more than you do. So thank you for, um, for kicking us and pushing us every now and then. 
Um, transnational threats, as he rightfully outlined, um, are a pressing issue in Europe. Um, and it also, I would say, challenges a bit the way the European Union works because security, especially national security, is still seen as a national issue, so something that member states deal with. Yet, by looking at the challenge of transnational repression, all the others, the bad guys, they don't care about borders. Um, they don't care about borders in terms of they do transnational repression inside the European Union. Um, they repress their own citizens inside the European Union, although they shouldn't. Um, and they have networks that span over European Union borders, but also to uh, Canada, Great Britain, and so on. So I really think uh, to live up to the challenge, we have to overcome this idea um, that security continues to be considered a national issue and actually benefit from the potential that we have or that we could have when we work together in the European Union. The EU has, in theory, acknowledged um, the problem of transnational repression um, and issued some statements, including a commitment by the Foreign Affairs Council to pay special attention to transnational repression. So we have, I would say, a lot of strong language, um, a lot of good recommendations, um, but we still haven't overcome this notion that it remains member states' business and whenever it gets tricky, um, also we from the European um, level are, are kind of pushed back. Um, I think we have seen that most obviously around the issue of spyware um, and spyware abuse, where it has, well, we have even set up an inquiry committee in the European Parliament um, just to meet member states' representatives telling us they are not supposed to tell us anything. So we had to rely on amazing work of Citizens Lab, Amnesty and others to actually um, get a full picture of the threat, yet we are still far away from finding a solution. And, and this battle be basically between what makes sense, doing it on the European level and member states pushing back will continue. Um, what regimes that uh, use transnational repression are doing is they clearly want to show human rights defenders, dissidents and others that they are safe. They are not safe anywhere. And we still live by this notion that these people are under threat in their own country and then we give them if we do give them political asylum here, then they are here and then they are safe. This is clearly not the case. Um, and we have to still fully acknowledge that and make everyone understand that. According to the work of Freedom House, Russia, Cambodia, Myanmar, Turkmenistan and China are the five biggest perpetrators of transnational repression in 2023. Yet we know of many other countries doing so. Um, Eritrea. Um, for example, in Germany is one of the countries that um, has a big, um, big hand over, over its diaspora. And we see Iran using transnational repression more and more. Just um, last week, Korea Serati from Iran International has been stabbed as a warning sign. Um, and um, we know of plans to assess, of previous plans to assassinate um, TV presenters, but also in Germany um, in the 80s already uh, with the Mykonos, um, we had um, a big attack on opposition. Um, in May 2021, maybe someone remembers that, a very, um, let's say, a movie-like um, action where Belarus forced a Ryanair flight to Minsk um, to, to land. Um, under the pretext of a bomb threat um, to arrest opposition blogger Roman Postasevich. Um, we have in Germany the so-called Tiergarten murder, um, where um, Germany accuses Russia to be behind the murder of Selim Khan Khangoshvili, a Georgian national. Um, the Indian government is accused by Canada and US intelligence. Um, China accounts for most documented incidents, and we know that they are even running extraterritorial prisons. So this is a very, very sophisticated infrastructure inside European countries. And we know that the Russian um, government is responsible for a number of documented incidents, including attempts to poison um, prominent opposition um, figures. Um, so the situation is quite bleak, I don't have to tell you. Um, and this is only um, what most people account for, let's say, the physical attacks. We also see that most of these regimes become much more sophisticated when it comes to online harassment, online intimidation, doxing, um, the use abuse of spyware. 
And something that we also tend to, to lose a bit sight of is how they're using their embassy and the fact that citizens need to go to embassies to have certain bureaucratic procedures done, like extension of passports, being able to marry, um, and so on, to also um, execute a lot of repression. I mean, um, the case of uh, Jamal Khashoggi clearly being the most prominent one, but we know, for example, of a number of Hong Kong dissidents right now that have problems to extend their passports so that they, they well, they continue to be just legal. Um, so, so this is also something that we need to find solutions to. Um, because I don't want to prolong that, we have the experts uh, in the room. I just want to highlight three trends that I find increasingly varying, and I wonder if you share those. The first one is, I would say I see a downward spiral. Um, if countries get away with repression, others copy the repression, and they learn from each other. So if one country is very good in using bots, um, for repression, others copy that. If one can run uh, extraterritorial police stations, others may try. Um, so here we really, really need to make sure um, that we stop them at the first time and not let them run for too long. The second one is we don't only have offline, but also online transnational repression. And the online part is growing. And the third one and I can feel that myself, is that they are no longer just and that is already bad enough, just targeting dissidents and their families. But they start also targeting the support network. So lawyers, um, organizations such as the one being with us today, members of parliament um, that are trying to support human rights defenders and others. And they do that in a very sophisticated and targeted way. I know, for example, that lawyers once they go to a court case to defend um, a dissident are being directly attacked 24 hours before. So that basically rather than preparing the court case, they need to sort out their passports and their banking accounts and everything. And this is a very toxic and sophisticated um, way of targeting. So we also need to step up in the cyber area. Um, if you said it, um, we are running into European elections. But I think we need to get ready and prepare so that we can start right away when Parliament is back to, to increase um, pressure on the EU to take this into account. Um, I can only push, um, but the knowledge sits amongst the experts um, who are with us here today. So I would actually like to, to conclude my um, introductory remarks here and hand over to the distinguished panel. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was really excellent. Thank you for the introduction and for giving us some really live and present examples also of this type of crackdown. And I think you spoke really clearly to the kind of new and evolving uh, architecture of, of repressive states reach. I know, Hannah, you will also come back in at the end of the interventions for some final marks. And we're very happy that you'll stay with us as well for the questions and answers. So without further ado, I'll pass to uh, one of our first speakers, which is Jacques Nuncronzia, who will speak in French. So just to um, alert uh, participants to uh, activate your uh, the interpretation if, if you need it. And Jacques, uh, merci beaucoup um, for your participation. Jacques is himself a victim uh, in a case of transnational repression by the Rwandan authorities in relation to his father's activity. So Jacques, uh, cinq minutes. Merci beaucoup. C'est à vous. Sorry, I don't hear Jack. Does anybody else hear? Jacques, vous avez uh, le micro? Merci encore. Là, vous, vous m'entendez voilà. là? Ça marche super, merci. Ok. Je m'appelle Jacques Nkuronziza, j'ai 48 ans. Je suis né au Rwanda et je vis en France depuis 2003 avec toute ma famille réfugiée à l'époque. J'ai été séduit par la politique rwandaise qui incitait au retour au pays parce qu'il disait qu'on pouvait. Eh, on n'avait plus rien à craindre et qu'on pouvait s'impliquer économiquement. J'ai alors pris la décision en 2010 d'y retourner. Donc, j'ai investi, mais les amis m'ont fortement conseillé de ne pas évoquer le nom de Ruti c'est mon père. 
En effet, il était l'un des fondateurs de la Liprodor qui re, euh, re, réclamait euh, le retour euh, au pays exprimé par les réfugiés rwandais pour trouver une situation, une solution pacifique. Il a été arrêté pour complicité avec le, le FPR. Après le génocide, il est nommé préfet, mais démissionne faute de pouvoir se conformer à la politique du FPR. Il a été arrêté, il a été emprisonné pendant deux ans sans, sans inculpation. Puis, heureusement, relâché, mais il continua à dénoncer les abus et violations des droits de l'homme. Il était défendu par des ONG. Et nous avons dû fuir le Rwanda en 2003, alors que j'avais décidé de, rest, de, de, de rentrer au Rwanda pour visiter le pays et faire du business. J'ai été prévenu de ne pas parler de mon père qui continuait à critiquer la, la politique du FPR. C'est à cette période que la situation a changé pour moi, car en janvier euh, 2021, deux personnes non, non identifiées sont venues m'arrêter sans mandat. On m'a amené au Rwanda Investigation Bureau. Euh, une fois arrivé, on m'a confisqué mon téléphone, puis m'a noté à une autre personne inconnue pendant deux jours et demi, dans une pièce commune à d'autres nombreux détenus. Sans manger, sans hygiène, sans bien, sans bien dormir, et car j'avais du mal à respirer, car j'étais toujours ménoté. L'ambassade de France, alertée par mon père, a délégué quelqu'un pour me retrouver et n'a pas pu, car ils m'ont déplacé plusieurs fois de prison en prison. Cependant, grâce à ses efforts, elle y est parvenue et certifiée na ma nationalité française. Elle a obtenu mes droits, c'est-à-dire voir un médecin, et, car j'étais très malade à cause des conditions de détention et avoir des repas dignes préparés par mes amis. J'ai été libéré au bout d'un mois et demi et j'y ai pu, et ai pu euh, enfin donner des nouvelles à ma famille. Mais seulement quatre jours après, dans la nuit, j'étais chez moi quand tout à coup, trois personnes non identifiées m'ont allévé sans motif annoncé. Quand je suis sorti de mon domicile, j'ai trouvé qu'une dizaine de, euh, de, 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 de personnes armées venaient d'arrêter mon meilleur ami aussi. Ils nous ont amenés séparément vers des endroits où sont arrêtés les Vagabond. Pendant ce, ce trajet, à, à, à l'arrière, couché au sol, je ne devais pas voir où j'allais. Encore une fois, nous étions fréquemment déplacés toujours séparément, car je ne l'ai jamais revu. Sans jugement ni motif valable, ils ont failli m'amener dans un cas de délinquant sur une île qui s'appelle Iwawa. Comme ma famille et le quai d'Orsay sont intervenus, j'ai pu obtenir un avocat qui est intervenu à ma faveur pour me localiser au, au, au RIB afin d'avoir enfin un jugement et me défendre de ces, de ces injustices. Et j'ai pu ainsi retrouver mon pays pour rejoindre ma famille. Pour moi, comme pour mon père, il ne fait aucun doute que les multiples arrestations que j'ai subies étaient une forme de, de représailles contre les activités de mon père, une manière de le punir, et, et, mais aussi de l'intimider. J'ai eu la chance d'avoir une protection et un soutien et diplomatique. Malheureusement, d'autres activistes opposants et autres ont subi un sort similaire, voire plus dramatique encore. Ils ont été forcés de quitter leur pays. Malgré, les, malgré leurs formes multiples, ces formes de, de répression extraterritoriale 
affecte les droits fondamentaux et la sécurité de nombreuses personnes qui résident en Europe même. Mais il est essentiel que l'Union européenne s'équipe pour empêcher que des gouvernements puissent tout, en toute impunité éteindre leur répression et leur intimidation jusque sur le territoire européen. Merci beaucoup pour votre écoute. Merci beaucoup, Jacques. A lot of information there in five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, really, for sharing your personal testimony with us. I think really powerful to hear how this is impacting on, on people uh, across Europe and, and beyond. Without further ado, I'll pass to Philippe. Uh, Philippe Dam, EU Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch. Philippe, I think you're going to take us more into the response. We've heard what the reality can be of transnational impression to natural repression and I think it'd be really good to hear from you what the EU can do actually in terms of responding uh, to these issues. Merci Yves uh, et un grand merci à, à la membre du Parlement européen Anna Neumann pour uh, uh, héberger cette discussion. Juste une phrase en français pour uh, remercier Jacques pour uh, son témoignage qui est un rappel poignant de, de, de ce que représente la répression transnationale pour un grand nombre de personnes qui, qui ont choisi l'exil ainsi que leurs proches. Euh, et le message, on l'a bien vu, de leur gouvernement est clair. Ni eux, ni leurs proches ne doivent se sentir en sécurité euh, en Europe ou euh, dans leur pays d'origine s'ils décident d'y retourner. So, I'll switch to English now. Um, and the reason we are calling the EU to urgently address uh, and prevent transnational repression is because Jacques and his father's case is not isolated. Uh, Hannah mentioned a few other examples, but I will also mention China's so-called overseas police station, the stabbing of um, a Nazeri blogger in Paris, or um, at activists from Tajikistan who see dozens of their family members arrested back at home simply because they organize a peaceful protest in Berlin or in Warsaw. Transnational repression is not a new phenomenon, but it is clearly now global and it is exacerbated by the emergence of new technologies. In October last year, um, at Human Rights Watch, we published a, length, a lengthy report on Rwanda's uh, global transnational repression practices And uh, this year, a report which analyzes dozens of cases of transnational repression, which came at Human Rights Watch's attention. This shows that whenever you do human rights work, you in inevitably comes across demonstrations of the long arms of repressive governments. And from deliberate crimes like murders or physical attacks to much more insidious forms of harassment and pressure, pressure like the denial of ID documents, or attacks on relatives at home, or abusive extradition requests, or smear campaigns, the goal is the same, to silence critics, to governments, and to create a chilling effect on those who might still want to feel safe abroad. And by doing so, those uh, repressive governments violate a multitude of human rights of people who, despite living in Europe, um, have very little or much less protection than they deserve. Um, before I move to, to a few policy recommendations, I think I, I want to highlight a few observations from our reporting. One, victims are not just human rights defenders, and some of them are also journalists, political opponents. They may also include a much broader spectrum of country nationals living abroad. And that's why EU's policy responses needs to focus not just on human rights defenders, but on a broader category of victims and potential victims. Um, secondly, the patterns of transnational repression are cross-border in nature, um, and therefore it's likely that a repressive government that undermines the right of um, um, in one EU member state will use the same practices in one or other EU member states. And because TNR is cross-border, it makes it even more important for the EU to strengthen its responses and its preparedness to prevent uh, the phenomenon. Thirdly, The states involved in transnational repression can already be routinely criticized by the EU for their human rights record at home. And I think here about Russia, Belarus, and Iran. But others include countries as well, which are a bit more immune from EU criticism, despite the bad situations at home. And that includes Rwanda, but also Bahrain or Saudi Arabia, for example. Worse, in some cases, EU governments 
are risking to be complicit of TNR. For example, in the case in which they don't prevent illegitimate removal requests. And we have reported on the examples of Spain removing a, a former caporal to Algeria or Austria and Germany deporting critics to Tajikistan before those people immediately reappeared in arbitrary detention or in court. So it's really good to see that TNR has started to gain more prominence in Europe. And Anna mentioned the commitment by the Foreign Affairs Council last year to pay more, uh, and this year again to pay more attention to the phenomenon. Uh, we also saw reports at the Council of Europe about the topic. And of course, the European Parliament's report uh, uh, adopted last year on which Hannah Neumann was the rapporteur. But in fact, there is still a lack of genuine and cons consistent policy response. Uh, and even when it comes to using foreign policy tools on which the EU has a common policy. In fact, uh, we haven't spotted um, uh, statements by the EU's foreign policy services uh, uh, criticizing the cases of, of, of uh, TNR or uh, using its bilateral engagement publicly to address it. So looking forward, we really believe that TNR should become integral part of EU's foreign policy agenda and that both the EU and um, EU member states use um, their public voice and their engagement bilaterally to flag it. A, a few recommendations now about what could be done. First, it's important to map and better understand the scope of the problem. And here we hope and we recommend the EU member states as well as the EU's external action service, EU member states foreign ministries and the EU's external action service to uh, create a focal point within their different services to better gather information about the patterns of TNR, um, whether they are sufficiently domestic by domestic institutions, police or justice, their diplomatic presences on the ground or even by independent non-governmental organizations. Two, use of diplomatic influence, both on individual cases, of course, when it is safe for the victims and their communities to do so, but also via bilateral channels, via public statements, or in the context of human rights dialogues, bilateral high-level meetings, and others. Three, increase practical protection, ensuring that tools to protect human rights defenders, including the human rights defenders guidelines, or tools to support uh, defenders who, are, who need to, to seek international protection are also fully implemented to protect those who need, uh, who face TNR outside of their countries of nationality, including when they are already in the EU. Four, factor TNR in every aspect of bilateral cooperation with countries practicing it. When it comes to the need to review development assistance, economic cooperation, security and military cooperation, for example, in the context of sales, of transfers, of surveillance technologies when there are at risks of being used to commit TNR, or even extradition treaties, all of which, which could make the EU member states more complicit to TNR. And finally, two last points, the need to train your diplomatic staffs to ensure that they are better aware of the various forms that uh, TNR can take, both within the EU, but also uh, in, in, in third countries where it is important to document it. And I'll conclude by the need to act on Interpol, uh, because we have documented a, a large number of abuse of Interpol's so-called red notice and the need, we believe that there is a need to monitor and set stronger benchmarks to ensure that Interpol is not abused by, by states which may commit TNR. I will stop here and I really hope that the European Parliament in its next legislature can help us to build uh, a stronger responsiveness at the EU, building on, 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 on the most recent texts which were adopted and ensure that the EU, EU's external action service, member states and the Commission are better prepared to respond to the phenomenon. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Philippe. Um, really good intervention and thank you also for laying out how the long arm of repressive governments is of course a cross-border challenge requiring cross-border responses and you've laid out some really clear recommendations there about to how that could be addressed in policy and practice. Our next speaker is Saipira Sarah Furstberg who's a research fellow at the University of Venice. Saipira you're here? Great. Um, I think we'll hear from you a bit more about We've heard from Philippe what the EU should do, what the issue is, what's at stake and what the EU should be doing. I think you're going to take us a bit more further about what the EU is currently doing and how TNR is currently being approached. And I think we really look forward to hearing your reflections on how it could be approached better. Thank you so much.
Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you for inviting me uh, for the event. Uh, so uh, my intervention today is focused on how the EU as an actor currently responding to transnational repression. And this is what my research is about. I was actually, when I started this research, I was um, interested to examine what are actually the current EU tools uh, and policies in place to address, to address transnational repression. And unfortunately, um, what I found is that um, EU and its member states are actually not doing much to address the issue. And um, there are several explanations for this outcome. Uh, first, um, although we uh, we mentioned today that transnational repression is not a new phenomenon, but in the EU context, it's still a new and evolving phenomenon. And in fact, it's only since recently that we have started to pay attention to the transnational repression issue within the EU. And this event actually proves that. Um, second, I think uh, the problem is more broadly related to the conceptualization of transnational repression. Um, so in the e current uh, EU context, uh, transnational repression uh, is mainly seen as a peripheral security issue, which is embedded in the broader uh, core frame of uh, hybrid threats and authoritarian interference. And um, it has not been recognized as a distinct category of authoritarian interference for which specific measures um, are needed. Uh, if we observe now the work on the EU on countering hybrid threats and authoritarian interference, uh, we can uh, see that it's actually largely centered on improving situational awareness, uh, raising um, resilience against uh, cybersecurity, um, and also resilience uh, against uh, disinformation campaigns uh, and uh, information manipulation. Uh, and in this work, uh, what we can see is that uh, transnational repression is absent or peripheral. Um, and, um, and thirdly, um, the, the other problem is that um, the need to raise the issue of transnational repression from the national to supranational level um, needs to be driven by the member states. Um, and as uh, we mentioned today, uh, uh, with, uh, as Hannah Human mentioned today, uh, um, transnational repression is very much uh, related in the domain of um, member states, uh, just as uh, countering hybrid threats and authoritarian interference. And here, uh, what we can actually see that a member states attitude uh, on how they respond to transnational repression uh, diverge. So some states uh, show some reactions, uh, either a little bit and others uh, not uh, at all. Um, and what we can observe is that in fact, the vast majority of European countries fail to recognize and preemptively act uh, on transnational repression threat. And this is uh, largely related to the lack of understanding uh, about the issue. And uh, if uh, I would like to uh, now, uh, Alice, if you can uh, show the slide um, on, um, yes, so excellent, thank you. So um, this is a slide that is uh, extracted from the data from Freedom House. Um, and uh, when, we, when, I, uh, when I just mentioned to you that some states uh, are uh, um, alert on transnational repression, others not at all, and others are actually very yeah. much complicit uh, 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 on, on issues related to transnational repression. In fact, what we can see that although 24% uh, of uh, uh, individuals are have been subjected to assault or assassination, uh, we can also see that 46% uh, of these individuals uh, have been detained uh, and 17% and of them have been uh, either um, unlawfully deported or extradited. Um, and this actually demonstrates that our European uh, democracies are actually complicit uh, in uh, enabling uh, transnational repression to take place. And this is uh, largely facilitated by geopolitical interest uh, and also economic and uh, trade um, cooperation that um, democracies uh, maintain with uh, authoritarian states. And I think this is um, important uh, to address because uh, such action actually perpetrate uh, the transnational repression to take place uh, in, the, in the EU. However, uh, this is uh, not the case uh, for all the member states. In fact, uh, what we can actually see that uh, national experiences with transnational repression incidents uh, also uh, leads to different attitudes among countries uh, to the issue. Uh, so um, some countries like Germany, for example, um, have uh, alerted at some point uh, individuals who have been uh, subjected to threats or to surveillance by the authoritarian home states. Uh, and they also provided police protection to people uh, under such threats. 
Um, and in 2019, uh, as Hannah Newman have also mentioned, uh, German, uh, German authorities have also expelled uh, Russian diplomats in relation to the attack of the former Chechen separatist fighter Zelim Khan uh, Kaganshvili, uh, who was assassinated in the broad daylight uh, in Berlin. Um, other states like Sweden, for example, uh, and uh, also uh, the Netherlands are actually uh, criminalized uh, or working on criminalizing uh, acts of foreign interference against uh, dissidents and diaspora communities. Um, under the Swedish espionage legislation, for example, uh, secret information obtained or disclosed or passed to another state are considered as a direct harm to Swedish security. So, for example, in 2010, a Swedish court uh, sentenced an ethnic Uyghur uh, refugee to six months in prison for spying on a fellow of refugee and passing information uh, to China. Uh, but, however, uh, such developments are not uniform. Um, as I mentioned to you, some states are actually um, do not respond to transnational repression and do not regard it specifically as an issue in, it in itself. Uh, this is, for example, uh, the case uh, of Italy. And so, um, in my conclusion, what I will say is that uh, by taking a weak stand to respond to transnational repression, the EU effectively grants uh, legitimacy and uh, continuity uh, to such authoritarian patterns to take place. Um, however, I think such approach is very much short-sighted as acts of transnational repression undermine uh, political liberties of vulnerable population um, and civilians residing in democracies, and we've witnessed today uh, Jacques' testimony. And uh, for this reason, I think there is a need uh, for the EU to formulate uh, adequate policies and to tackle such forms of authoritarian interference. Um, and I think a good start uh, would be by addressing the conceptual challenges related to the definition of authoritarian interference. Um, currently, uh, EU authoritarian uh, interference uh, fails to actually distinguish between different forms of authoritarian interference, uh, thereby making it difficult for policymakers to formulate uh, targeted countermeasures. Um, and th therefore, I, I would invite here um, Hannah Newman and her team, if, uh, and I hope very much that your mandate will be extended, uh, to address some of these conceptual challenges involved um, with mapping up uh, authoritarian interference threat so that we can actually start formulating adequate uh, countermeasures to, uh, to target those national repression practices, um, as been said um, by Philip uh, earlier on. So I'll stop here because I think my five minutes are just on. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Saber. You took us to a really clear uh, path there in terms of the issues around definition or lack of prioritization or lack of that many trade and economic interests are often coming first and also then coordination or as you said lack of often by EU member states so thank you for really clearly mapping that out some really good examples there and also at the end for giving a clear steer to the European Parliament the next one about what countermeasures are needed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jana Goroskovia who's research director at Freedom House. Jana you're here? Great. So, Jana, we're going to hear from you a bit more about where um, transnational oppression fits within the toolkit, let's say, of, of authoritarian governments um, and also how cross-cutting in many different areas. So without further ado, I'll pass to you. Five minutes. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Eve. And I'm really pleased to be here. And I think a lot of my comments will reiterate what uh, Philippe and what Saipir have also uh, said and also uh, Jacques' experience. Um, so Freedom House has been tracking transnational repression for, for the last five years. We actually have a database uh, that includes incidents of uh, physical transnational repression from uh, 2014 to 2023. And what that data shows, uh, as my colleagues have said, is that this is really a global phenomenon. So we have um, recorded incidents committed by 44 governments all around the world uh, in over 100 countries. Um, this is widespread. And while transnational repression typically takes place in what I think um, a lot of us would call authoritarian neighborhoods, so these are places like Central Asia or Southeast Asia, where like-minded governments act together against their, their and uh, foreign dissidents, What's really interesting is that among democracies, most transnational repression takes place in Europe. Um, and so I'm really pleased uh, to be here and to be speaking with the European audience and European policymakers, because it's really important um, that action starts to take place here. 
So with my somewhat limited time, I'm going to limit myself to just two observations. Uh, one is that um, I want to point out, uh, I think as Siberia already mentioned, transnational repression is not the same as foreign interference, and there are reasons to treat it separately. And two, that even though it's a really multifaceted problem, there are clear policy pathways forward for addressing it. And I'll suggest a few uh, of those. And I think, again, my observations will overlap with my colleagues. So first, Freedom House defines transnational repression as a set of physical and digital tactics used by governments to reach across borders in order to silence, intimidate, or coerce exiles and members of diasporas. And while transnational repression is undeniably part of the toolkit to spread authoritarian norms globally, and that, that toolkit also includes election interference, uh, disinformation, foreign malign influence campaigns, Despite all this, it's crucial to continue to treat transnational repression as a separate and unique phenomenon. And that is because it impacts most directly a separate and unique group of people. And I've already mentioned who those people are. They are exiles and members of uh, diasporas. These people have left the territory of an authoritarian state, but they continue to have ties to an authoritarian regime, whether that's through family, whether that's socially, psychologically, legally, financially. And those ties open them up to specific human rights violations. These are things like the targeting of family members or extradition requests or the denial of consular services, uh, illegitimate uh, Interpol notices, um, interference with their asylum claims. These are all very specific threats to this group of people and to their rights. And while that threat also impacts the quality of the democracy in which, in the country in which they have settled, uh, that threat first and form foremost impacts them. So what can we do? In practical terms, one of the first steps is to adopt a clear, formal, official definition of transnational repression, one that can be used by the EU, but also by member states to design policy interventions. Adopting a definition will uh, do a number of things. One is that it'll spread awareness among governments. It'll create a focal point for policy action. It'll serve as a catalyst for internal tracking of incidents. So all of these things are really important for creating effective policies. So now I'll move on to my second point. Transnational repression is a multifaceted threat, and it touches on a lot of different policy areas. And I think Hannah Newman and others have already spoken about this, but it touches on things like immigration and asylum, security and foreign policy, domestic policies. But rather than viewing this complex nature as a stumbling block or as a problem, I think it's actually something that we can take advantage of. It means that we can take policy action in lots of different arenas all at once. So first, I'll, I'll suggest some policy uh, actions that we can take. First, as uh, Philippe and others have mentioned, um, transnational repression needs to be included as an explicit consideration when governments are actively seeking uh, when governments are actively seeking to deepen connections with um, uh, other governments. So. Um, cooperation on issues of trade, on issues of security, on issues of immigration should all consider whether the government, the third party government, is engaging in transnational repression. And as Saipira pointed out, what we really need to make sure is that the EU and member states are not inadvertently contributing to the problem of transnational repression in their pursuit of establishing bilateral relationships. Turning to domestic issues, the European Parliament should push forward with recommendations that were outlined in March of 2023 on the EU guidelines and human rights defenders, which suggested reassessing existing programs of support for foreign human rights defenders who've been resettled in Europe to consider uh, the threat posed by transnational repression. As, as Hannah Newman observed, we have this idea that once you're resettled in uh, Europe, you're safe, but we know that's not the case. And so assistance for human rights defenders should really include consideration of transnational repression. Moreover, we should really think about whether the current category and definition of human rights defenders actually encompasses all the people who are targeted by transnational repression. For example, often students or journalists don't fall into this category or this definition, but they are in fact targets of foreign governments. Lastly, I want to conclude by drawing attention to a growing problem, um, and that is the denial of consular services and the refusal to renew passports as a tactic of transnational repression that requires immediate attention by the European Union and member states. 
An increasing number of exiled activists are at risk of being left without official documents, and that will hinder their ability to travel, uh, to get um, banking services, to establish themselves in new countries. And this is because authoritarian governments are unilaterally deciding to discontinue consular services. This is the case with the authoritarian regime in Belarus, which recently announced that they would not renew passports abroad. And so of particular concern are Belarusian citizens in Europe who cannot be expected to, to return to Belarus to renew their passports and who will very soon uh, be in need of uh, other alternative documents. A few, a few governments have already started taking action on this, um, and I think others uh, should follow suit. So in conclusion, um, Europe is home to many of the world's exiles and diasporas, and it can definitely do more to protect people and mitigate against the threat of transnational repression. And I look forward to seeing what uh, the new European Parliament will do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jana. You really helped us uh, underline here the importance of European action for what is a critical uh, European problem. And thank you, too, for raising the key issue about human rights defenders. Even if relocated, they can still be targeted. And of course, the very live issue of passport renewal and also how that could be solved. Thank you so much. If my final speaker now, thank you, Marcus, for patiently uh, waiting to the end. Marcus Michelson, you're a senior researcher with Citizens Lab. Without further ado, I'll pass to you five minutes and then we'll go to the questions and answers. So participants, please keep the questions coming in the chat. Marcus, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Eve, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, round table. Uh, my input will focus on digital transnational repression, so the use of digital technologies to control and coerce uh, political dissent in exile and diaspora communities. This input is based on our research at the Citizen Lab. Um, we have conducted more than 100 interviews now with individuals who were targeted with di different forms of digital cross-border repression. And these uh, respondents come from more than a dozen origin countries, uh, and they live across uh, Europe and North America, among others. And the first point uh, I would like to get across here is that uh, digital technologies are a core element of all forms of transnational repression. Uh, the internet and social media have allowed migrants to stay closely connected uh, to their countries of origin, and they have helped these uh, diaspora and exiled dissidents to mobilize for human rights and political change from afar. But authoritarian power holders are using these very same technologies uh, for political control and repression uh, beyond borders. And these regimes rely on hacking attacks, targeted surveillance, defamation and disinformation campaigns to intimidate and to silence political opponents living in other countries. And with this toolkit, uh, repressive regimes can extend their reach far into other territories in a very cost-effective way. They can monitor and threaten dissidents abroad on a large scale. And I would like to highlight specifically here that uh, women are exposed to particular gender-based uh, forms of digital repression. Authoritarian governments like Azerbaijan, Turkey, Iran, or Russia uh, weaponize patriarchal norms and misogyny to intimidate outspoken women across borders. Uh, these women are confronted to sexual harassment on social media and rape threats. Their personal information that is extracted uh, through surveillance is used to shame, harass them, and publicly smear their, their reputation. Uh, my second point would be that the that digital transnational repression has can have very deep and, and disturbing impacts. Many of our respondents experienced fear, stress, and burnout. Their mental health and well-being were affected. They reduced contacts uh, with families and friends. They cut relations with other diaspora members, and they engaged in self-censorship or withdrew entirely from activism. So digital threats clearly affect the safety and fundamental human rights of the targeted individuals, and they impede their full participation in the uh, host societies. So thereby these threats also undermine democratic processes in Europe. The European Union and its member states uh, should give a dedicated and firm response also to digital transnational repression. 
and raise the costs uh, for perpetrators. And I want to focus on three uh, recommendations here. First is to strengthen the digital resilience of civil society. Uh, more participatory and inclusive mechanisms are needed for investigating and deterring digital threats against civil society, including diaspora groups. The EU Agency for Cybersecurity, ENISA, and other authorities involved in cyber defense should take dedicated steps against digital repression. They could coordinate government resources, the tech sector, and civil society to share information on emerging threats and improve protection for high-risk communities. The second point is to push big tech platforms to address uh, digital repression against civil society. Targets of uh, digital repression often face still hurdles in reporting threats and getting support from tech companies. Platforms need more staff with training on human rights and gender issues and language skills uh, to support activists. So the EU could should push platforms to improve the accountability and protection mechanisms for victims of digital transnational repression. And the final point would be to continue countering uh, the proliferation of surveillance technologies. So the European Parliament should continue and intensify its efforts to establish oversight, transparency, and human rights safeguards on the use and trade of commercial spyware, because this spyware gives governments a powerful tool to invade the privacy of dissidents wherever they are. And many member states, as Hannah Neumann has pointed out, still resist tighter regulation by invoking national security interests. And this can open the door to spying on exiled journalists and human rights defenders, not only from their home state, but also from governments of countries uh, where they have sought uh, refuge. Uh, the example of Galina Timchenko, an exiled journalist, Russian journalist, whose phone was infected with the Pegasus spyware is here a case in point. So I leave it at that and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much, so much, Marcus, also for sticking to time. Uh, a really lot in there and really good to hear also from a digital perspective, again, what is happening, what has been done by the parliament, but also what is needed next. Colleagues, there's a lot of commonality uh, from all of those interventions. We heard about the many tactics being used uh, by repressive states, the many targets also, that this threat, threat is multifaceted, it's physical, it's digital, it's emerging, and that it, this threat is also, also intersectional. We heard about impact on women, migrants, LGBTI, and the point I think Hannah made at the opening about downward spiral, we heard again, not only in terms of approaches, uh, but also about impact on human rights and standards in Europe. And it's first and foremost about people. Thank you again to Jacques for opening and to everybody for really reminding us of that human story and reality. Hannah, if I may pass to you just for some reflections uh, before we open uh, to the questions. We have about 20 minutes left, so I would encourage people, if you haven't already, to do write questions in the chat. Hannah, it would be great to maybe just have you kick off. Um, having heard the speakers, any further thoughts from you? Um, sure, and um, I'm I'm quite impressed um, by the amount of knowledge um, that is out there on how we can improve the European response. Um, so, I mean, the start by Jacques was impressive again to just hear the impact it has on one person and the knowing how many persons there are where it is our job to protect them and how terribly we fail and the chilling effect it has on the communities as a whole. It's not the chilling effect on one person, but it has on whole communities that in a moment that we actually would need them to be active and speak up. And also in some cases, how these regimes do try to really divide the communities. So this divide et impera is something that they are trying to do also through transnational repression. I feel it mostly amongst the Iranians, but I know it's the same in a number of other diaspora communities. Where I can agree with everyone, and I think Yana and Saipira pointed this out perfectly, we need a proper definition of transnational repression. We need to map um, cases, but we also need to map approaches, trends. Um, we need to map the kind of national tools that we have in terms of prevention, but also addressing them. 
and then see the gaps we have. So, I mean, why why are we not learning from each other? Um, but why are we also not checking the gaps we have? Why do we just need to reinvent the wheel 27 times? It doesn't make sense. Um, then Philippe Kelly said it, um, transnational repression works cross-border, so prevention and addressing this needs to work cross-border. Um, and here I really think by throwing together all the expertise, including the one in the digital field coming from Marcos, to clearly paint the picture of how big the threat is and how we, we are in our response because we are divided into 27 is something that hopefully can raise some better understanding and not only... You all refer to the Foreign Affairs Council. Yes, we should make it continue to make it a foreign affairs issue, including on being good in statements, but it is a domestic security issue. And we need to get it there. And we need to make everyone understand that this is what it is before all. It's the security of people living in our own countries that we have a responsibility for. Um, then um, I like the idea on making this basically, I say, conditionality relevant. So whenever we deal with third countries, you make this part of the whole conditionality game um, that we use. And we need to strengthen with the resilience, especially digital markers, but, but, but also in the, let's say, um, traditional security sense. Um, I also agree with you. Um, we can use human rights defenders to open the discussion, but in the end, you can't do that on anyone. Even if they're just a commercial person, uh, you can't do that. Um, so we really need to discuss it from a just civil rights uh, or human rights or every human being's rights um, perspective in the end and include the digital. I was impressed, Jana, that you pointed out that um, uh, there are most cases in Europe. I, I want to look at those numbers, but they clearly indicate again that we need to step up our game. Great, right, Hannah, thank you so, so much for those those reflections and insights. And indeed, we hope to continue working with you and your colleagues in the European Parliament in, in the next term to take forward many of those practical um, suggestions and expertise also forward. So in terms of the questions, we have several questions uh, in the chat. And the first one I'll refer to relates to um, an issue on ju judicial response and judiciary in, in certain countries, perhaps not understanding uh, the concept of transnational repression um, and how and, and the response to it, I guess, again, from a victim-centered approach. So I think we'll have that question uh, in the chat. And Yana, if I may refer that one to you. Sure. Um, so I think the question was uh, the experience of someone from Kazakhstan who's resettled in Europe and having problems um, reporting incidents that may uh, have taken place. So this is actually, a, a, unfortunately, very, very common. Um, oftentimes, law enforcement and judiciary do not do not have uh, awareness of why someone would be targeted by a foreign government. And it's often treated as kind of a common um, sort of common crime or, you know, or even not taken seriously. A lot of digital attacks are not taken seriously at all and are pushed off as, you know, the government doesn't have or law enforcement doesn't have um, the ability to deal with that because it's coming from outside the country. So a couple of suggestions. Um, one is to keep all documentation of what's happening to you, uh, whether I know that it can be very unpleasant to receive messages online and threats and things like that, but it's very important to keep all of those um, to have a track record. Another one I would suggest is looking actually at the website of the FBI on transnational repression. You can just Google that. They have information sheets in lots of different languages. I think they're up to maybe 60 languages now, um, where they actually outline what transnational repression is, what kinds of um, how it manifests, how it threatens people. Um, and you can maybe even take that with you to the police station and demonstrate that, you know, some law enforcement, even if it's in a foreign country, has actually um, address this or begun to deal with this as a specific threat. I will just say, though, that um, I want to be clear that addressing transnational repression is not the responsibility of the person who is targeted by transnational repression. It's the responsibility of the government and law enforcement. And so I'm, I'm very sorry that this is happening to you and um, that this is, uh, I know that this can be very difficult to, to deal with. And so um, I hope that this event and uh, Freedom House and uh, Human Rights Watch and Citizen Lab and others raising awareness about this kind of from a top down um, way can help uh, people who are targeted. 
Great. Right. Thank you so much for that response, uh, Jana. And also, um, it's really important to hear also the numerous questions in the chat, I think, uh, about personal experiences uh, of transnational repression. We also have a question uh, to all panellists, a view on uh, spyware as a tool of transnational rep repression. Pegasus, of course, was mentioned er earlier by the panellists. And what are the possible policy responses? Can I see which of the panel would like to take that one? I can start from the policymaker perspective, and then I'm pretty sure Marcus will be able to complement. I mean, to start with, on the whole double standards thing, maybe European Union member states should stop using spyware on political opponents and journalists for a start, because that would make it much easier to address other suits with this. Um, this is what, what we're fighting for domestically, but then... Um, we, we can also step up our games when it comes to the protection of victims so that people who think um, they are being spied upon can have their devices checked. We have a number of civil society organizations, including Amnesty has uh, the, the possibility to check that. I, I know Citizens Lab has the possibility to check that. So that when you think either you, you w could be a target or you really feel that your phone is being tapped, you can go there, they check your phone, um, and they, um, where we, we still fall short is the moment that they, they realize that your phone has been hacked um, to guide you through the legal process, which already is a very difficult issue if you are a European Union citizen being spied upon in your own country, but it becomes even more complicated when this whole question of legal status of language of lawyers becomes problematic. And here, and we have made very clear recommendations with our inquiry committee that um, people need legal support. Um, and then the third problem that we still have at the moment is even if organizations such as Amnesty or Citizens Lab verify that your phone has been hacked, that doesn't mean that this is um, counted as proof. Um, so, so we still need to sort out a lot of things domestically um, that also apply to, to foreigners. But to foreigners, it is extra complicated because of language and lawyer and all of that. So here, um, our idea is that like we have um, the Citizens Lab um, who do a lot of work in Canada of victim support, that we want to build up a similar European institutions where victims basically go, have their phone checked and then get the full service support um, for legal and technical advice. Um, this is a clear demand we have, what we are pushing for, but we are not there yet. Great, thank you so much for that, Hannah. I think there was a few questions actually that we were receiving on, on the Pegasus uh, issue. I have another one now um, um, for, on the Rwanda example. Um, this is somebody who is a researcher and activist. Uh, and the question to the panel is, um, so I just check I get this. Maybe I'll just put the question in the chat because it is quite long, um, including on recursion and repression of, of refugees in diaspora. Colleagues, can I get you to refer to the chat and take answers? Right. Uh, in in fact, uh, th there are quite a lot of comments from from people who have faced uh, uh, from from Eritrean communities, and indeed flagging in particular the use of diaspora organizations um, to to harass and 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 put pressure on the members of the community. In fact, it's also um, a theme. So we we haven't ourselves documented the cases of the Eritrean diaspora. Uh, but this is a, a, a pattern we have seen in other contexts. And again, um, um, I don't know if, if uh, uh, Jacques will want to, to, to comment on that, but we have documented in the report we published on Rwanda um, uh, cases of, of the use of diaspora organizations to, uh, to target activists or uh, people who refuse to engage in diaspora activities and put pressure on the, on the broader uh, members of the community to use the, you know, the connection between people to, uh, to keep uh, harassing them. And, and, and sometimes, you know, that, that, you know, we've seen connections with cases of of some different forms of of, of smear campaigns against um, um, against individuals of that of, of that community. So this is a real concern, and I think in, indeed it's it's important for uh, you know European member states, but also others, to ensure that uh, 
uh, the, the the context of diasporas is is one which uh, which is taken very seriously and that uh, uh, reported um, uh, harassments of forms of transnational repression through it uh, are duly investigated with a view to protect people who may suffer from it. So I'll just stop here, but I hear, I, I hope it responds to some of the questions uh, asked in this context. Great, thank you so much, Philippe. Saipira, you with your hand up? Would you like to comment yes. on that? Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, come up first on the question of the Kazakh uh, individuals who've been persecuted in Belgium, being myself from Belgium, uh, I can understand uh, the frustration here. Um, first of all, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, uh, is that um, transnational repression is still a very new phenomenon for many countries, and so they don't know how to handle this, because the law enforcement agencies haven't received uh, appropriate information about transnational repression issues, and so the incidents are, are actually treated as um, case by case and not as a pattern. So, um, and th therefore, uh, in, it's it's quite difficult uh, for law uh, for law enforcement agencies to act on transnational repression. Secondly, because of the murky nature of transnational repression, it's actually very difficult to persecute. So, uh, I agree with Yana. One way would be to uh, collect uh, the. Um, uh, the, the your incidents uh, and present them to the police uh, and make a report of what actually how other states are actually doing uh, and coping uh, in in terms of transnational repression. Um, but the third uh, issue is that um, uh, Belgium is actually uh, the Belgium legislation actually is very much behind um, the legal enforcement related to authority interference and espionage law. Uh, I mean, uh, actually, Belgium uh, <laughs> law uh, Belgium is a perfect place for spies <laughs> because uh, our, uh, we don't really have a legislation that um, deters espionage laws or criminalize espionage uh, because our legislation is uh, dated back to 1930, so it's very old. Um, and uh, under the, the law, uh, espionage and authority interference are actually not criminalized. However, uh, I think uh, because uh, of the um, authority interference from Russia uh, and from other rogue states, uh, we are starting to slowly uh, working on this as well. So uh, I'm sorry to hear about your case, um, but uh, uh, and but I think documenting is can be one of the answer. Um, secondly, uh, I would like to add now on the Rwandan case uh, and as well as an Eritrean cases. Um, I think it's important to note that um, when we document cases of transnational repression in incidents, uh, at least um, uh, our information is actually based on open sources, right? Uh, so uh, we document very often cases that are or already publicly available which means uh, that uh, what we have presented uh, in, the, in different databases of transnational repression incidents is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, because transnational repression is actually very hidden uh, in nature, um, there are different challenges actually of researching uh, incidents on transnational repression. Um, and uh, if you want that, if you want to know more about it, um, you can email me separately and I can uh, answer your questions. Um, but on the Eritrean case, uh, we have uh, um, a great researcher, Nicole Hirt in Germany, who is actually have documented cases of uh, transnational repression on specifically on Eritrean communities. And she has raised the issue. Um, so um, I'm sorry if your incidents have not been raised uh, in the database, uh, but uh, uh, in the research community, we are actually aware about uh, yeah. Eritrea. So, thank you. I'll stop here. Great. Thank you so much also for, for clarifying that. I think on the issue of transnational repression on, on diaspora, we did have as a hand up. John Pratt, would you like to come in, John? Keep speaking. I can't hear you, John, but maybe just keep... How's that? Yes, there we go. There we go. I've got Thank you so much. You had a you had a question on this issue of transnational oppression. Yeah, I'll just take a quick second um, from Amnesty to flag that we're working on some research right now um, on transnational oppression affecting international students from China studying in Europe. Yeah. Um, so that's forthcoming in the next month or so. Um, and we had some very interesting findings that align with I think what all the panelists have spoken about. Um, and in particular, I just want to highlight the impact beyond individuals um, in HRDs or activists and on diaspora communities more broadly. Um, I think what we found is that students across the board who had no personal history in activism were also proactively self-censoring and that sort of hidden impact of TNR is very difficult to identify. Um, but I think that's quite an important aspect of it to work to track and document and account for, uh, which we're working on doing uh, through this report. And then also to say that the impact, I think, in the university context is particularly profound because this sort of self-censorship 
by entire communities from a certain national origin also deprives academia and other researchers in Europe from their insight and their experience um, in their home countries. So a very interesting and important aspect of transnational oppression and demonstrating that it, it, it is a broad based problem affecting um, individuals across diaspora communities. I think some of the things that we would love to recommend in the space is the ensuring that frontline staff are educated and trained on transnational oppression, including police and border services, um, including that incidents are effectively investigated and prosecuted where appropriate. Um, and in the university space, educating administrators about the issue of transnational oppression, because we did find quite a degree of a variance between and among institutions um, of awareness and understanding of the issue and how it impacts students and scholars specifically. Uh, in terms of questions, I do wonder though, how can we track and account for this chilling effect and self-censorship caused by transnational oppression? Because that is a really challenging statistical question if we're looking at responding to it. Um, and then also how can governments and the EU more broadly work with and coordinate private and public private entities such as universities or large private employers in implementing protections for individuals affected by transnational oppression. Great, thank you so much, John. And I'm sure everybody's looking forward to that report, which will come out in mid-May, uh, Amnesty's report on transnational repression against Chinese students. Any of the panel want to take that? And then I think we have uh, Waltrude for the next question. I see a hand up from Saipira. Yeah, uh, I think I just want to respond to John here, how we can tackle um, or I would say start countering transnational repression at the EU level. Um, I think um, EU has actually uh, formulated this hybrid toolbox uh, where there is uh, uh, information about how to tackle cybersecurity or also FEMIT. Uh, but uh, and, and I think transnational repression can be uh, one of the aspects of this toolbox. Um, and uh, um, it can be actually a platform uh, where uh, individuals can um, share information about transnational individuals, I would say member states, uh, where they can uh, share and facilitate um, uh, information exchange among member states and starting actually also document, uh, documenting specific patterns uh, of transnational repression. It can be also used as a platform for providing support uh, and also expert uh, expertise uh, specifically on cases related to detention so that uh, member states actually respect uh, international human rights law. Uh, and, uh, and I think by collecting this information at the member states level, we will be also able to provide better support uh, for individuals who have been affected by transnational repression. Great, thank you so much. Jana, you also wanted to come in on this? Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment, uh, just to say that uh, Freedom House actually published a report on transnational oppression at universities this January, uh, and um, it is a very serious problem. Uh, we It's yeah. one of the few reports we did where the entire, uh, all of our inter interview subjects chose to be anonymous. I think that speaks to the chilling effect, uh, the fact that people don't even want to go on the record to talk about how transnational repression has affected them. And certainly while I think that the transnational repression perpetrated by the PRC uh, is probably the most dominant, I think it's also important to note that um, students and scholars from Egypt, from Rwanda, from Saudi Arabia, from Turkey are all experiencing transnational repression. Um, and it is affecting not only, I mean, most directly their experience, but it is affecting the quality of uh, education at um, institutions of higher learning in the US and Canada and all across Europe. So I think this is a, an important kind of frontier in, in this work. Great, thanks so much. I know we're rapidly approaching uh, end of time. Uh, we do have questions also from some of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, Waltrude, I'm not sure if you want to come in. And, and we also had somebody from the UNPO uh, present. Colleagues, one of you want to ask the question? If not, I can read it. Please read it. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm not sure the logistics at this point, sorry. Okay, so the question from uh, Voltrude was, any thoughts that the panelists have on advocacy steps at member state level? We've heard a bit about what the EU could do, and I think several of you have mentioned national examples, but um, advocacy steps at member state level. And maybe you ask the final question from you and Pio as well, or you put in the chat so that we can maybe respond to both at the same time? Yes. Yeah, I know Hannah does need to leave quite promptly. Yeah, that's um, so yeah, any anything? Maybe I'll let Hannah come in in first on on answering that um, if that's okay. 
Um, well, I, I can try to give my best. Um, mm. I, 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 I take two remarks and considerations on this question with me also for the debate as we're having it in the European Union. The first one is we are still, and that is a major shortcoming, still conceptualizing human rights as something that happens with third countries. Um, and that builds into this whole understanding. We have a human rights defender. We give them support like for digital security and physical security, or we give them a visa and then they are here and then we're done. Um, so really need to understand and that's something I did in my human rights defender report already understand that the threat doesn't stop there and that we need to work yeah. on the protection of these people once they are here the second one and I found that quite interesting is to move the debate away from national security to fundamental rights um, first of all I think it works quite easily because a number of the people that are threatened are actually European Union citizens um, they just have another passport that doesn't make them less European Union citizens. So that's where I think we can really work with the fundamental rights issue. We can also work on the fundamental rights issue when it comes yeah. of um, support network being targeted. And I, the, I would be very interested also in one or two of you making a study on this one, because my understanding, it is more and more the case that whoever supports people that are targets of transnational repressions, they become um, targets of transnational repressions themselves. And this is really an issue because then we are talking about journalists, we are talking about lawyers, we are talking about politicians, we are talking about people that under, are under special protection inside the European Union when it comes to fundamental rights, whose rights are compromised. Um, so I think we need to shift away from, it's sad that I have to say that, um, from it's some foreigners that are targeted by their foreigners' government, so it's actually a foreign, foreigners' issue, which is still... Especially when I think about the Chinese students um, at my university, the issue of Chinese students was dealt like this. It's a, it's a, it's a Chinese issue. Uh, yeah. We are not going to interfere. As an issue that really compromises how we understand our societies and our security. Um, and this is how I think we can get this going. So if, if I could have one wish, please work on the support network and how they are becoming more and more targeted with very severe doxing and other attacks. Thank you so much, Hannah. We and really then fingers you. crossed that I'm coming back and um, <laughs> I will pick it up if I do. Indeed, we cross our fingers too. So indeed, uh, thank you everyone for the for the for all the interventions, a really rich discussion. I'm amazed that everybody firstly managed to keep the intervention within the five minutes. I think that was the first miracle, uh, but also that we got so many, much rich discussion also in the chat. And thank you everyone for staying to the end. I, I think it's really been striking to me um, at the big interest and public interest in this event and this discussion. This is really clearly a very critical issue for many diaspora communities living in Europe. It's clear there's a lot of interest and we're really so indebted and grateful to them for sharing their experience. I'm sorry the time didn't allow us to get to all the questions in the chat, but thank you for your participation. Thank you for raising your stories and thank you for continuing to remind us as well of the human stories and human cost behind this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eve, for hosting the event. <laughs>